somewhere I can plug in to get audio. Um, well, we're recording this. Yeah, I wanted to, but there's some kind of stupid concert that they shot us too, so I I don't know where to have you plug in audio. Um, our tech person is over here. Okay. And I really don't want to mess with this. I really do not want to mess with this. And all of this is locked. So, is there a recorder we could just have you put on the table here? Or, I mean, I'm happy to share the video recording with you. Um, yeah, we're going to have to start again in just a moment. I didn't know I know. I'm going to do it here. Yeah. Okay, I'll do that. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you?
Okay, is everyone able to hear me okay over this mic? And is it going through the room? We're going to go ahead and get started. So let's go ahead and take our seats. It's about five after. You're good? Okay. No, a little bit louder. A little bit louder. Okay, I'm just going to hold it up like this because we have it as loud as it'll go in there. So, um, All right, so welcome and thank you for coming. My name is Kathy Becker. I am an MENR student, which is a Master's of Environment and Natural Resources here at the School of Environment and Natural Resources at Ohio State, as well as a member of the Executive Committee of the Ohio Sierra Club and chair of the Ready for 100 campaign. Get in a better position. It's not Okay, okay, let's try it. Um, so, Ready for 100 is a campaign to ask cities to commit to 100% renewable energy. Um, so far, 139 cities have made this commitment. In Ohio, that includes Cleveland and Cincinnati. Just this past week, we gained Philadelphia, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and Arlington, Virginia. So, it's, it's really moving along. And we have a table in the lobby. We have a couple of um, fantastic Ready for 100 volunteers, and if you would like to sign our petition to ask the city of Columbus make the same commitment, it's on our page. So we're so excited to welcome everybody to this low carbon appearance with author and environmentalist Bill McKibben, who will be speaking on the climate crisis and the 2020 election. And special thanks to the organizations who are tabling out front. These tables will still be available for about half an hour after the event. So tonight's event with Bill McKibben is low carbon. Um, so that means that he's not here in person, he's here on Zoom. And we did it this way for a couple of reasons. Um, one is this is the only time he had to speak with us before leading up to the fourth Democratic presidential primary debate, which is Tuesday night. Um, but the other is we're climate activists. And so we should be welcoming and pioneering these low carbon appearances. This is a way to share and get knowledge and information without uh, making a lot of carbon emissions. So this event is going to be done through a question and answer format. Um, so when I'm done with introductions here, um, our two moderators will be asking about three questions each, and uh, Bill will answer those questions. And when that's done, then we'll take audience questions. And so for all these questions, we'll have people line up on down the aisles here. There are little steps just a little bit to just line up down one aisle or the other. And we'll alternate sides and we'll do that for about a half hour. And our only caveat is that this actually needs a question and not a statement. We want to get as many questions as we can, so please don't take more than a minute with the question. Um, when you come up, you'll do what Carolyn and Terry are going to do, which is to speak to the eyeball mic right there <laughs> and that's how um, Bill will see it through. So with that, um, let's move into introductions. So Bill McKibben is an author and environmentalist who in 2014 was awarded the Right Livelihood Prize, sometimes called the Alternative Nobel. His 1989 book, The End of Nature, is regarded as the first book for a general audience about climate change. And he has been translated into 24 languages. He's gone on to write a dozen more books. Um, Bill is founder of the group 350.org, the first planet-wide grassroots climate change movement, which has organized 20,000 rallies around the world. It spearheaded the resistance to the Keystone Pipeline and launched a fast-growing fossil fuel divestment movement. So moderating this event, we have two great environmental activists in Central Ohio. So Terry Hermson, and you want to stand up and say hi to everyone. <laughs> uh, Terry Hermson is professor of English at Audubon University, and he is spearheading the creation of a regional sustainability hub, pulling together sustainability professionals and advocates in cities and counties um, across central Ohio. This is quite an undertaking. 
Uh, Terry's also an accomplished poet whose book, The River's Daughter, was co recipient of Ohio Poet of the Year Award, and he conducts poetry night hikes in Ohio State and National Parks. So, Carolyn Harding, who's also here. <laughs> Um, she's a grassroots environmental activist in Central Ohio who co founded the Columbus Community Bill of Rights, um, which also has a table in the lobby. So, CCBOR has gone through three campaigns to gather enough signatures to put a Bill of Rights initiative on the Columbus City ballot. And last time it went to the Franklin County Board of Elections and they had all the signatures they needed. We counted that yes, the seat on the ballot. The Board of Elections said no, it cannot. So they are challenging that legally and meanwhile gathering another whole set of signatures. And Carolyn also hosts um, the weekly radio program Grassroots Ohio on community radio station WGRN 94 FM, 94.1 FM every Friday at 5. So without further ado, let's get started and I'll give Terry the first question. So I'm going to stand somewhere where you can see me. Is this good at all? Can you hear me? Yeah, so look into the mic. Look into the mic. Yeah, and sit, step back. And just step a little back bit. just a yeah, little so bit. So you can see yourself right up I there. I can see myself. But you want to look into the eyeball. I can see you even when you're sitting down, Terry, so don't worry. All right, All right great. So it's an honor for us to be with you here tonight, Bill McKibben. For so many years, you have brought an historians and a writers and an activist eye to the crisis of our times. So I want to reference this book. Can you uh, see it from there? Indeed. It's called American Earth, and it's a great compendium of writers from Thoreau onward, writers and activists who have worked uh, frequently in both fields, writing and working for, for, for change, such as John Muir and Alda Leopold and all the way up to Rachel Carson and Rebecca Solomon. So in the light of this book with this audience to some degree metaphorically here with us, along with the audience in this room and the audience that will be at Otterbein on Tuesday night. I want to ask one simple question. What's at stake in the 2020 election for the fate of the earth? Well, Terry, first of all, thank you for your work and, and everybody else is there. And thank you also for letting me come in this low carbon way to you. It's not as good as being there in person. Um, it would be more fun for me to be there in person, but this is the kind of thing we're gonna have to get a little used to as we move into this new age. So your question is the right question. What's at stake? Um, and it's really a question about time. Uh, what makes the 2020 election different? Um, I've been thinking a lot about time recently. We just passed, for me, the last week was the 30th anniversary of the publication of The End of Nature, which was the book I wrote in 1989 that was the first book for a general audience about climate change. And back then we were in the business of giving warnings about what would happen if we did not stop burning so much coal and gas and oil. Well, we didn't stop burning so much coal and gas and oil. In fact, we kept burning more and more and more. So those warnings have now turned into bulletins from the front line, you know, of the kind of daily carnage. As we meet here today, uh, there are hundreds of thousands of people in California, the richest place in the whole world, who have no power because it's so dry and uh, the fire danger is so high there that the electric utility has literally shut down all the power to keep their lines from sparking forest fires. As we meet here today, earlier today, the president of the Marshall Islands in the South Pacific declared a national climate emergency for their country because the highest place in it's about a meter above sea level. Um, we're now seeing climate change in its early stages. Uh, we've raised the temperature of the planet about one degree Celsius, 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. That's enough to have melted most of the sea ice in the summer Arctic. It's enough to have killed off most of the Great Barrier Reef. It's enough to have upset the planet's hydrological cycles such that we see far more drought and far more flood. Um, and that's the early stages of climate change. 
we're on a path at the moment to raise the temperature between three and four degrees Celsius. And if we do that, then we will not be able to have civilizations like the ones we're used to having. It'll just be too damn hot. So our moment of leverage over this is now fairly short. Having wasted 30 years, the scientists tell us we have little time left to avert those kind of massive temperature increases. <clears throat> Last October, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change put out a, um, uh, a new version of their climate science study showing that if we hadn't made what they described as fundamental transformations in our energy systems by 2030, and they defined that as reducing carbon by about half by 2030, we had no chance of meeting the targets that we set in Paris. Now, all of you know how the world works. If you want something big to happen in 2030, uh, you better start doing it right now because our political and economic systems don't turn on a dime. We've wasted the last 30 years, so that means we've run out of time to waste. There is no more time for procrastination. So aside from having to get rid of Donald Trump, who is, a, in my mind, a, a, a venal and dishonorable man, um, we also have to get rid of the prevailing systems under which we've operated for uh, long before Trump came to office. And the good news is we have some capacity to do that. Over the last decade, the engineers have brought the price of solar power and wind power down by 90% or so. It's now the cheapest way to generate power around the world. If we wanted to make quick change, we could. It would take real effort to kind of pearl her. Harbor esque kind of effort for the years of World War II. But that's within the realm of possibility. Um, the thing that gets in the way, I think, above all, is the overwhelming power of the fossil fuel industry. <clears throat> the overwhelming power of the fossil fuel industry governs everything that happens in Washington under the Trump administration. We need that to stop if we have any chance of getting where we need to go. Hi there. I'm Carolyn. Um, can you hear Bill? You can, hear, can you turn it up a lot, at, at all? No. Bill, can you can you get closer to your mic? I can shout a little louder. My okay, voice. that's great. Okay, I have another question for you. How would you characterize the attention to the climate crisis so far in this long presidential primary and election? Do you see any promising developments, and what's missing? I see um, all sorts of promising developments. Um, you know, climate change has never been a real serious part of our political debate before this cycle. We began to see a few sort of breakthroughs in 2016. Bernie Sanders that year in the debate with uh, Secretary of State Clinton was asked what the most important challenge facing the world was. And he said, without hesitation just said, well, the climate change, of course, which is the obvious and correct answer, but an answer that really no one had ever given before. Um, I, he asked me to represent him on the platform writing committee last time around. And after a lot of fighting, we hammered out a pretty good platform on climate change in 2016. Definitely the most progressive the Democratic Party had been. But pretty much every contender in this year's elections um, um, are way, way more progressive on climate than that platform was. There's a change this time around. And it comes for a number of reasons. Probably the most important is that we've just kept organizing. People like the people in this room, the people asking the questions, have just kept the fight on. And after sort of 10 years of building a climate movement, we're finally at the point where everybody understands. The polling data shows that among Democratic voters, climate change is the most important issue as people cast their votes. 
And interestingly, it shows that um, even among Republican voters under the age of 35, climate change is a truly important issue, maybe the most important issue. Um, and that means that candidates are responding this time in remarkable ways. Senator Sanders, again, has put forward a remarkable platform, uh, as has Senator Warren, who put out her uh, environmental justice portion of her platform yesterday, and it had all kinds of interesting and powerful things in it that we can talk about. Uh, and many of the other candidates, the same. Um, um, even the sort of candidates that for the moment are lower in the standings. Uh, Tom Steyer is running on the promise that uh, climate change will be basically the only issue that he goes after, uh, uh, on and on and on. So there is real energy this time on the Democratic side because voters are demanding it. This, you've just led into the question I was going to ask, and I don't know if you are, want to go this far, but I think many of in this, of this in this room are trying to make some distinction between the various plans and are kind of looking to you, would you be able to, to weigh in on various plans and say, you like this one, make some distinctions between them? I think we'd be most grateful for that kind of analysis. Sure. Um, last time around, uh, I was very, and, and, and 350 Action, our political action team, were very active in the Sanders campaign during the primary and then in the Clinton campaign during the general election. <clears throat> this time in the primary, we haven't chosen any candidate because we decided it was most useful to try and make them all climate candidates, to try and kind of force the consensus around <clears throat> to the left, uh, to the direction of physics and chemistry, really, in this election. And so far, that's been very, very useful. Um, there are differences between the various candidates, um, uh, but there's a lot of commonality. I would say pretty much everybody agrees on uh, the need to end subsidies for fossil fuels. Pretty much everybody agrees on an attempt to have a kind of rapid build out of um, uh, renewable energy at a kind of dramatic pace across the country. And to me, very interestingly, everybody seems to agree on the premise that at least on federal lands, public lands, we should cease drilling and mining for fossil fuel. That's actually really important. U.S. public lands are taken as a whole the fifth biggest country in the world in terms of carbon emissions. They trail the US as a whole, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and India uh, in terms of production of carbon. So ending uh, public, ending um, um, mining and drilling on public lands is a big deal. And it's a big change. This is what we started talking about six and seven years ago as a kind of keep it in the ground plan. And people looked sideways at us when we did it because it seemed so unlikely, but now it's pretty much orthodoxy. There are also differences. Um, it's a little hard to tell because some of the candidates have uh, you know, tried to avoid specifics to some degree, but um, earlier in the campaign, a kind of controversy broke out when Joe Biden's advisors on energy said that he was looking for a middle way on uh, energy production. And it made people think that maybe he meant a return to Barack Obama's all of the above energy policy, which was pretty ruinous because the US in the Obama years became the largest producer of oil and gas, largest producer of hydrocarbons in the world, passing Saudi Arabia and Russia. Um, um, Biden sort of said that he didn't mean that, but his you know, top advisors, many of them came from the fracking world. Um, and so there was some discomfort. And I think there continues to be probably some, uh, and people continue to hope that he will clarify what he intends to do. Both Sanders and Warren have said quite straightforwardly that they intend to try and stop fracking, um, which would be a very important step. 
uh, and not an uncontroversial or easy one to do, uh, especially off public land and onto private land. It's necessary to do it because we've got to staunch this flow of carbon into the atmosphere. Earlier today, there was a story saying that the big oil companies, Shell, uh, Chevron, others, had plans to increase their production of gas and oil about 35% over the next 10 years. That's literally insane. Um, that's a kind of suicide pact for the planet. And most of that increase is coming in the United States. That's become the biggest place where the biggest increases in the production of oil and gas are coming. And so if we're going to do anything serious about climate change, we're gonna to have to slow that down. Um, that takes us to Ohio, where we are. Um, since 2010, almost 3,200 fracking wells have been drilled in the Utica Marcellus Shale in Eastern Ohio. And um, here in Central Ohio, we're getting the frack waste. We are getting injection wells dumped into old abandoned vertical oil wells, and they have deregulated the drill cutting, so now they can dump solid frack waste that's radioactive in landfills and not regulate it for radioactivity. Um, in, Ohio, in Columbus, where we are, nobody sees many drill rigs, but people are not aware there's all these injection wells in our watershed taking place. Um, and also, there's a huge build out to the Appalachian Storage Hub, which is on the um, the corridor of West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, where they're planning on storing ethane so they can make plastics. And this big Appalachian storage hub is um, being invested in by a Thai company and a South Korean company. So Ohioans in that area need jobs. They're former coal areas. Um, what do you say to what well, all of us are climate people, but how can we impact decisions in Ohio about this buildup in fracking and frack gas? Well, look, um, fracking, one of the things that always strikes me about fracking is it's one of the few times people in the, in the industry ever gave a name to something that actually kind of sounds like what it is. Um, like, it really is a bad technology. Um, it's a way to kind of get the bottom of the barrel in terms of hydrocarbons. And to do it, you have to do pretty dramatic things. You have to basically blow apart the subsurface geology. That's why a bunch of places have decided to ban it. I mean, we managed after much fighting to win bans in New York State and in Maryland and in many places around the world, France and Scotland and uh, uh, much of the rest of the world. We just, one, our colleagues in Brazil just managed to get fracking bans across two of the two sort of big shale states in Brazil, which is pretty remarkable considering the Bolsonaro government and what's going on. Um, fracking does a lot of bad things locally that we've described. It also, and this point took a while for people to understand, it also does very bad things for the climate. Natural gas and fracking was sold as a cleaner alternative to coal, but it turns out that that's not true. I actually have a piece up in the New Yorker today that explains the math of this. Over the last 10 years, the US has replaced a lot of coal-fired power plants with fracked gas power plants. That means that the amount of carbon that we emit has gone down, but carbon is not the only greenhouse gas. The other important greenhouse gas is CH4, methane. And when you frack, you release a lot of methane into the atmosphere. So carbon's gone down, but methane's gone up and taken together, it means that America's greenhouse gas emissions have been about flat. What we have to do, if we're at all serious about climate change, is move past all the fossil fuels and directly to renewable energy. We used to think of natural gas as a bridge fuel that would give us this uh, uh, you know, bridge 
till the time when renewable power was really ready to take over. Well, that time has come. I mean, it is literally the cheapest way to generate power in most of the world now, including most of the United States. Uh, sun and wind are enormously useful, and they become more useful each week because the price of the storage batteries uh, that turn them into 24-hour power sources keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. So that's what we need to be doing. We need to make that transition. In that transition, there are many, many jobs to be had along the way. Um, and that's, you know, if we had all the time in the world, we'd make this transition slowly because slow transitions are easier and cheaper and everything else. But we don't have all the time in the world. We have almost no time. So we have to make this transition fast. And that, I think, is why Senator Warren and Senator Sanders have been so outspoken about trying to bring fracking to an end. So many of us, uh, many people, and myself included, see the Green New Deal as one way to out, maybe one of our better ways out. Uh, but then, of course, there's the question of cost and, and where do you fall on the application of the Green New Deal? Can we pay for it? How do we pay for it? And what happens if we don't take this level of action to address the climate crisis? Well, look, you asked the question in, in, in a sense in the right way. And the one that rarely gets asked, it's like, um, cost compared to what? Um, the first thing one should say is, 30 years ago, <laughs> we had a lot of relatively cheap and modest things we could have done. You know, uh, 30 years ago, a modest tax on carbon would have steered the super tanker that is the global economy a few degrees off course, and by now we'd be in a whole different ocean. You know, but instead, the fossil fuel industry pursued this uh, uh, strategy of climate denial, of lying about what they knew. And for 30 years, they basically stopped us from taking any action. So now, whatever action we do take is going to have to be fairly dramatic. That's what happens when you wait. It's like, you know, it's like you're 20 years old and you stop smoking. Well, that's good. Chances are that's all you're going to have to do. But if you smoke till you're 50, pretty good chance you're going to end up under the knife, you know, uh, uh, dealing with lung cancer. Well, that's where we are now, and it's not pretty or easy. However, the cost of it, uh, 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 however many trillions of dollars it costs, $10 trillion, whatever it will cost to do this uh, transition, is money well spent for two reasons. One, as you do it, you're entering a world where, in fact, the price of fuel then goes way, way down and your economy um, gets a lift as a result. I mean, that's the reason that Exxon hates solar power because once you've got the panels on your roof, once you've paid that money, the sun comes up in the morning and delivers your energy for free. And from their point of view, that's a terrible business model, you know? Um, so the price of energy goes way down with this. More to the point, if we're able to arrest climate change short of its most lethal maximum, the amount of money we save is almost endless. Let's say it costs $10 trillion to do this. The last estimate, and I quoted this in a piece in The New Yorker in the summer, the last estimate for the price of dealing with a world where the temperature goes up three degrees Celsius six or seven degrees Fahrenheit, um, the price for that in some of the studies runs to about $551 trillion, which is more money than there currently is on the planet. Okay? If that seems hard to imagine, just go to a city like New York or Miami and just stand there and look around you and try to figure out what it would cost to move or recreate that uh, uh, you know, 50 miles inland. Um, um, how do you do it? How do you relocate bridges and roads? We're already paying this price. 
I find the, the easiest people in the world to convince about climate change are people who run Department of Public Works in towns in places like Ohio or upstate New York where I've lived or whatever. Um, um, because they know that we're already seeing this kind of change. They've been systematically having to put the expense of pulling out eight inch culverts and put in 12 inch culverts in every, you know, er every road they have because the old book doesn't work anymore. And it's not like the old book's just going to, we're going to do it once. If we keep on this treadmill, this is all we're going to do. And it's where all our money is going to go until there is no more money. So if there was ever money well spent, it's money spent in this kind of transition. Okay, so political will. <laughs> the political will in Ohio is pro-fracking, pro-fossil uh, fuels. And right now there's a bill, Senate Bill 33, which would um, criminalize protesters at, in, at critical infrastructure, which means pipelines, frack drills, anything that's connected with the oil and gas. Um, because, and I'm sure it's spurred from um, Sandy Rock and the pipeline protest there. So, and then we just know that in New York, the uh, Extinction Rebellion, has been doing massive um, sit-ins and protests. So what do you think has, what does this kind of like um, um, civil disobedience, is that the next step? Because all of us are finding out that going the legal way, going to the state house, they, they um, you know, preempt us and stymie us and stop us in every stop. So I think with, with this desire for the Green New Deal and for this huge transition, talk about um, civil disobedience. Sure. Um, so the fossil fuel industry is a big beast and you've got to attack it in a lot of different ways. Some of the time you've got to use civil disobedience. It's a tool in the activist toolbox. I, I, help lead the organizing for what's still, I think, the biggest uh, civil disobedience action in many years in this country when 1,200 and some people went to jail at the start of the fight about the Keystone Pipeline. Um, and it was very effective. It took what was a minor and obscure issue and made it into a national, indeed international one, and set off the kind of opposition to fossil fuel infrastructure that we've seen all around the world in the intervening eight years it was well worth spending some time in jail. Um, um, it can't be the only thing that activists do, or even probably the main thing. Most of the work continues to be the kind of daily mundane work of organizing, letter writing, lobbying, uh, uh, Facebooking, all the other things. But there are moments when you need to underline the moral seriousness and the urgency of a crisis, and that's what groups like Extinction Rebellion are doing this week. I would add that I increasingly think that along with paying attention to the political centers of power, we also need to pay a lot of attention to the other sorts of power on our planet, which is the financial power centers. Um, we've run this big divestment campaign around fossil fuel. It's been highly successful. Uh, we're at about $11 trillion worth of endowments and portfolios now that have divested from fossil fuel. And it's had a big effect on the companies. Shell described it in their annual report this year as a material risk to their business. And there have been a lot of Ohioans who have helped. One of the first of uh, big colleges in the world to divest its endowment was the University of Dayton, um, um, for which we were very grateful. We're now, I think, about to launch a series of campaigns in the next year that will go after the big banks that are the biggest lenders to the fossil fuel industry. The Chase Bank, which is the biggest of all, lent $196 billion over the last three years to the fossil fuel industry. Since the Paris Accords, their lending has gone way, way up, not down. Um, that's why by next spring, we're going to be asking you to cut up your chase cards, uh, move your bank accounts, 
sit in at the Chase Bank. I don't think they've yet, I mean, they're probably criminalized going after pipelines, but it may be a while before they get around to telling you you can't sit in in front of your local branch of Chase or, or Wells Fargo or Bank of America or whatever it is. But that's also going to be some of this work going forward, and it'll be on many fronts. But yeah, look, um, the only way to say it is the planet is way outside its comfort zone, so we need to be outside our comfort zone too. And you'll figure out different ways to do that. Um, um, I would say that if you're planning civil disobedience, this is one place not to let, not to make young people lead. Young people are leading this fight in all sorts of ways. You've seen these amazing climate strikes around the world. You've watched Greta Thunberg, who turns out in person, she's really wonderful, as great as she is from a distance. I, I really like her. Um, that's terrific. But for 19 year olds, you know, having an arrest record may not be the best thing on your resume. Past a certain age, what the hell are they gonna do to you? You know? <laughs> Sometimes it's important for those of us with hairlines like mine to do some leading too on all of this. Okay, so we've had the first set of questions. Um, so why don't we move now into audience questions. And so if you have a question for Bill McKibben, um, let's just form two lines on either side, just kind of up the steps on either side of the room, and we'll alternate sides. And then when it's your turn to come up to the mic, um, I think we don't even have Just that. line up along the side, please, so people can see. Thanks. So, up against the wall, right? Up on the stairs. There you go. What's Greta like? <laughs> uh, she's very short, and uh, I doubt she weighs much more than 70 pounds, but she's uh, tough as nails and good humored about all this and very, very focused. Um, <clears throat> and Right now, you saw the pictures of her coming across the ocean on the sailboat, yeah, um, which was really a great thing to do. And when I talked with her, she said that it had been great fun. I think that she really enjoyed for a little while being out of reach of the public eye and things. Right now, she's traveling around the American West. She'll be at Standing Rock. She was either there today or she'll be there tomorrow. She's on to Denver to do school strikes this week. Um, and then headed, I think, up, I don't know, up into the Pacific Northwest and down into California before she heads down across Central and South America, ending up in Chile in November for the UN Conference on Climate. And then somehow she's got to get back to, to Sweden, um, I guess, on another sailboat. But she's great. And you know what? Watch your, uh, watch your uh, news uh, program tomorrow morning, it wouldn't surprise me if tomorrow morning we learn that uh, Greta Thunberg is the next Nobel Peace Prize laureate. Mm -hmm. so, let me go on this side. And then we'll do the next. So, uh, Maybe just right in front of Caroline. Yeah. And then if you look in here, it'll, okay. it'll thank you that. so much for speaking to us. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I was hoping to see you in person, but this is actually better <laughs> um, for, for, the, for the big picture reasons. Um, and I wonder if you could please uh, speak. So far, you've been talking about reducing emissions, um, but there's the flip side. We already have too much carbon in the atmosphere and we need to do something to take the excess out also as well as stopping releasing the excess so i wonder if you could um, speak a little to that uh, there of course you know there are natural systems through uh, planting trees sequestering in plants sequestering in soil some inorganic methods um, sucking it out of the atmosphere bearing it in the ocean whatever i wonder if you could just spend some time talking about some of those possibilities and how feasible it Thank you. It's a really good question. Yeah, look, um, as the name of our 
group, 350.org, will tell you, uh, we're already way past where we should be. We're now at about 410 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere and going up about three parts per million per year. So yeah, I focus a lot on stopping pouring more into the top of this bathtub, but it also would make sense to try and widen the drain at the bottom so that the excess drained out more quickly too. And people are getting better at this, or at least thinking about it. Um, there are some natural systems that help us. Forests and oceans sequester lots of carbon. If you think about it, that's where fossil fuel came from in the first place. Uh, it was old trees and old animals and plankton and things that eventually, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, eventually uh, took a lot of carbon and, and buried it underground as they were buried by geological processes. We don't have time for things to operate on quite that scale, so we have to look for ways to speed that up. We can do that by planting more trees, uh, though there's not enough ground on earth to plant all the trees you need just by themselves. The forest scientists are starting to think that it's at least as important to let old trees keep growing. Trees seem to sequester more carbon the longer they live. So like they sequester more in their third quarter century than in their second quarter century, for instance. So it's a good idea to, to leave forests intact as much as we can. Soil is one of the systems that has the most promise for increasing uptake of carbon from the atmosphere. If we can build healthier soils with more tilth, then they'll sequester more carbon, perhaps quite a bit more carbon. The French government was the first government to pass a kind of law or initiative in this direction three or four years ago. And it incentivizes farmers to store more carbon in the soil each year, and it seems to be working pretty well. Um, this is difficult to do in this country because the lobbying power of big agribusiness is almost as fierce as the lobbying power of big oil. But it's really important work that does have to be done and we should keep on it. There's a group, if you're interested in this, there's a group called Soil for Climate, Soil Number Four Climate, uh, that is doing good work about passing model laws in a number of states that uh, call for increased uh, carbon in the soil. And uh, that's really necessary. There's some language about this in the Green New Deal, but it hasn't been fleshed out yet and needs to be. Good afternoon, Bill. It's a pleasure to meet with you in this manner from Ohio. My name is Michael Greenman. I'm the national moderator of the Move to Amend Interfaith Caucus. And I understand you've spoken with our national leadership about Move to Amend, so I believe you're familiar with this uh, activity, which uh, is promoting HJR 48 in the Congress at this time with about 70 co-sponsors for the purpose of eliminating corporate constitutional rights and money as speech. And if you understand that, you also understand that the amendments passage is really the one clear path to allowing us to make changes in rules, regulations, and laws in a post-amendment new government that will actually lead to changes in perhaps reducing emissions and pollution by corporations and others. So my question of you, Bill, is will 350.org and your participants and followers uh, be willing to join the Interfaith Caucus of Communities of Faith around the country who believe that with our millions, we have the power to propose and to have a good chance of getting approval in Congress of passage of this uh, bill and the resulting amendment. I'm, I'm happy to continue bringing my, um, you know, Methodist uh, body to this uh, work. And, uh, uh, and I've, as you say, worked with Move to Amend in the past, and people were working to overturn Citizens United and other important parts of this. Getting rid of the idea of corporate personhood is really important. It's a kind of bizarre doctrine that, well, I mean, look, I mean, if corporations were going to be persons, one of the most important things about persons is they die. 
Um, and, and, you know, corporations never do, and that's the problem. They just continue getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, um, and so I think that work is really important. And I think that standing up to fossil fuel is actually a hugely important part of that work. If you look at the people who are causing other problems in our politics and economy, they're heavily over-concentrated in the world of fossil fuel. Look, the Koch brothers were able to buy one of our political parties because they were the biggest oil and gas barons in the country. That's where their money came from. They own more of the tar sands, there's only one of them now, but, uh, uh, than, the, than anybody else. Um, and, and if we went to a world that ran on sun and wind, there'd still be rich people, but there wouldn't be Koch brothers level rich people off the fossil fuel. And so we begin to move in that direction. That's why I think these fights are so complementary and people working hard together. Now, I cannot enlist every member of 350.org in the Interfaith Caucus because some, some of these people, believe it or not, are, uh, are not church-going um, uh, folk. But I think all of them are standing up for uh, democracy uh, 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 in one way or another, and we will find um, all kinds of support among them. But thank you very much for what you're doing. If I could just add that the Interfaith Caucus is not just communities of faith, but also of ethical convictions. And I would put 350.org, Sierra Club, and all the other climate-oriented NGOs in that same category. Good. And Me too. If you to this, we can do it. Good for you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Hi, Bill. Thanks for taking time to talk to us. I'm uh, Oli Tuovinen from Microbiology Department. And I was wondering, uh, I have so many uh, connections with my European colleagues that in the carbon neutral energy area, is that issue as controversial and as political in European Union as it is here? I'm not sure I know what you mean. Well, you had talked to uh, you. You had talked about the sustainable energy area and uh, political resistance and economic resistance to that in here in the states. Is it more accepted in European Union? And uh, what's the general uh, trend? It is somewhat more accepted in Europe. Europe has been ahead of the U.S. in this. I think largely because the fossil fuel industry is mostly headquartered here. Um, and the European, even the European oil companies have been marginally, I stress marginally better, uh, Shell and BP, because they face a more informed public. And some of the European countries have actually done pretty remarkable things. Germany has done more than any country on earth to lower the cost of solar power. They started installing it in large quantities back when it was expensive 20 years ago. And their demand for solar panels is what allowed the Chinese to pioneer the low-cost production of photovoltaics. And so we owe great debt to the Germans. And, you know, as usual, if everybody in the world was Norwegian, the world would work pretty well, you know. I mean, those countries in, in general act pretty responsibly. Uh, uh, they've moved to cut their carbon emissions, even though they're a big oil company, country, Norway has now divested its sovereign wealth fund, its trillion dollar sovereign wealth fund from fossil fuels. So they've made some strides. They haven't gone far enough uh, and you know, people continue to have to campaign hard there, but Europe's ahead of the rest of the world. Uh, uh, the US and Asia trail far behind in their commitment. Although it must be said that both China and India are now installing renewables at a pretty remarkable rate. China especially is installing more renewable power than we've ever seen on the planet by far. More than half of all the renewable energy that went up in the world last year was in China. Thank you. Hi Bill, thanks for being with us again in Columbus. 
uh, oh, by the way. White people, uh, divided as we are politically, uh, are probably one of the least um, determinate constituencies in determining the outcome of elections these days, despite our disproportionate numbers. Um, and yet we have disproportionate resources as well. The first people to be impacted by climate change, of course, are people of color, especially in the global south. We know that environmental organizations such as 350 have acknowledged that quite well. My question though is that given the, uh, the increasing importance of participation of people of color, of poor people, of women, of youth, et cetera, how can we who have disproportionate resources marshal those resources to create uh, a platform for people of color, for the first effective, for the people who are always on the front lines to lead the movement instead of us? How can we make that space available and fortify it with the resources that we have? Well, I think the first answer to that question, which is a really good one, and it really is always worth remembering, that the iron law of climate change is the less you did to cause it, the sooner you suffer and the harder. Um, I, I think the first answer to that question is stop doing damage. Uh, it's uh, rich people's wealth in the great banks and asset management companies and things that now fund the fossil fuel industry. So getting it out of there where it can't do that kind of damage is key. That's why we're gonna be asking you to cut up your chase card come spring, okay? Um, those resources, when we run this divestment fight, it's through a organization called Divest Invest, and we urge endowments and institutions and portfolios to pull their money out of fossil fuel stock and put them into precisely the kind of technologies and community projects that would allow communities to flourish. It's why you're way better off putting your money in a credit union or in a public bank, if there is one in your area, uh, uh, that fund the things that need funding instead of pouring money into the things that you desperately can't imagine how to keep funding. On a global level, the rich world needs to, at the very least, keep the promise it made in Paris to send $100 billion in, in resources from north to south every year to help the global south cope with climate change that they did not cause. And at the moment, we're not coming anywhere close to meeting that commitment. Of course, the U.S. has pulled out of the Paris Climate Accords altogether, which should be a source of great shame to us. The country in the world that's emitted the most carbon, historically, is the only country in the world not engaged in any one global effort to actually slow down global warming. Bill, can you get closer to your microphone? I can try, and I have time for one more question here before I have to go. Hi, Bill. Uh, you, you mentioned Chase Bank, and you just mentioned Invest and Divest. Uh, I'm interested in a, uh, uh, I would like to support companies that are climate smart, avoid companies that are not. Is there somewhere I can go to that will tell me uh, up-to-date information like cut up your chase card or don't chop at Kroger's, that sort of thing. Yeah, there are some, but we need to get better at it. So keep tuned, um, especially on this question around financial institutions. By early spring, there's going to be a big, broad offensive across the environmental movement. And if you're tracking places like 350.org, you'll know all about it. Don't, don't cut up your chase card prematurely. We need you to... Uh, wait until it will make maximum impact. <laughs> awesome. One more, yeah. Okay, I realize you have to go. I have a real quick question. I'm concerned about the decisions against internet neutrality and its effect on environmental movements. And I'm wondering if you feel the same way, how you feel about that. I do. I think that um, the internet has gone from being a tool for organizing uh, to being increasingly a tool for suppressing organization. I think that the way that uh, uh, it's developed um, um, it makes it much more difficult for groups like 350.org to 
break through the, um, the, the powerful monopolies that get in the way here. My, um, my wife, Sue Halpern, covers this industry for The New Yorker and has written great piece after great piece detailing exactly how rotten this system has become. I would say that uh, uh, one of the things, aside from her climate uh, work, that makes Senator Warren stand out in this field is the fact that she's promising to break up the big tech companies. And I think you got a sense that that might be getting through when you read that uh, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook said he considered it an exist her election an existential threat. Uh, I got to say, uh, anything that uh, Mark Zuckerberg considers an existential threat sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> Um, that's that's sort of what I'm thinking. I just want to thank you guys enormously for bearing with me, and uh, it's well, thank you. Enjoy the debate, and we will see you in the spring when it's time not only to stand up to the political powers that be, but to stand up to the financial powers that be too. Take care, everybody. God bless. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for coming. There's still tabling out in the lobby if you haven't had a chance to check out the various organizations that are here. And, yes, and we'll be posting the video. I'm not sure where yet, so. <laughs>